so thank you everybody for coming to this session, uh, which is called the Use of Artificial Intelligence by Public Authorities. My name is Marianne Fernando. I work as a senior policy advisor for European Digital Rights, and thanks all for coming. Today uh, we'll have the honor to have Varun from Tactical Tech, Estelle from Access Now, uh, Jay from uh, ACLU, and Frederica from Privacy International. Uh, but most importantly, we have all of you. So this is supposed to be a very open and friendly conversation. I remind you that uh, this session will be recorded. The audience will not be recorded, so that means that whenever you ask a question, try to make it loudly, and then uh, I will repeat it um, to the best of my capacity. Um, so uh, the questions uh, that we discussed today is uh, first, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? But most importantly, uh, once we uh, set the scene, is what recommendations can we have for public authorities when they use uh, technology or artificial intelligence in general? Uh, so Varun, uh, we'll start from uh, Tactical Tech uh, in a few seconds. Great. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Varun. Can everyone hear me in the back? We're good? Great. All right, as Marianne just mentioned, um, the goal today is to have this panel obviously have it be interactive, but the end goal is, of course, to draft some recommendations for how public bodies use automated decision making. Um, and I thought it would be helpful just very briefly to tell you a little bit about my background so you have some context as to my angle on this problem, where I'm coming from, and perhaps how that shapes how I think about it as well. My academic background is in statistics and economics. I spent a summer working with the Chicago Police Department, helping them refine their predictive models of violent crime. Um, I worked as a data scientist in Silicon Valley for a few years, and now I'm part of the Tactical Technology Collective in Berlin. Um, of course, there's this question if we're talking about governance of AI, what is AI? And there is no universally accepted definition of what AI is. I think if you talk to technologists, they'll say it's actually just um, a bunch of different distinct technologies um, all encompassing a bunch of subdomains under this umbrella of AI. Business folks say one thing, policy folks say another, the public has another impression of what it is as well. Um, so I think just putting it on the table right now that this is kind of this vague evolving word to begin with is helpful. Yeah. Uh, and do you, uh, okay, so I just want to ask uh, the other uh, panelists very quickly. Uh, so do you agree, is there, do, does your organization have a definition of artificial intelligence in the sense that you know the answer uh, to the question or do you admit that there's no definition and still that's fine? What's your take, briefly, like I mean, two minutes? I think of it as a spectrum. On the one hand, you can have a spreadsheet that does some calculations and on the other hand, you can have like human level AI and somewhere in there is machine learning that kicks in and in many ways, a lot of the policy issues that come around automated decision making kick in with that spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be that complicated. And then there are additional policy issues obviously that come in when you get more black box machine learning algorithms. Um, but um, but so that's how I think of it. Estelle, do you agree? Yeah, um, I think we're facing a little bit the, the similar issue. Um, if you can speak. Sorry, from, from my organization, Access Now, we're working globally on uh, following some AI regulation type of proposal and why we see a lot of government really eager to regulate AI, there is uh, as a starting point an agreement on what AI is or can be and even within the community. Um, so as Jay said, you can start from a basic um, algorithm or you can get into more complex profiling to machine learning. So um, we repeat that in many different debates, but as a starting point before asking how, how to use AI or what what to do with AI, we should start defining what we're talking about. So we agree that it's not just robots, uh, right, as uh, some people um, may think. Uh, what is free AI? No, robots. Not just uh, robots. When we talk about artificial intelligence, <laughs> people, not, well, it could be rubbish as well. Uh, but definitely not just only uh, robotics. So what's Privacy International take on, on this? So I think to make it even more complicated, we wrote <laughs> a submission to the uh, House of Lords. They set up, uh, in the UK, they set up a select committee on artificial intelligence. And what we wrote is the term is used to refer to technologies at various, very different levels of abstraction and complexity. There are some policy, and it is being employed in radically different contexts. There are some policy challenges that apply at all levels of complexions and abstraction, um, but there are some that are, rel that are radically different depending on the technology at use. And I think we also have to keep in mind that some problems are relevant in one context, but not so relevant in others. 
So I think it is highly context specific, so, um, which is why I like the focus of this panel on the use by public authority. I mean, I can give an example. We had a lawsuit in Iowa, by Iowa from the ACLU of Iowa. Uh, they were getting contacted by a lot of people who were having their benefits, people who were disabled, who were having their benefits cut with no explanation, drastically. Um, and they were asking, and, and we asked on behalf of these people why they were getting their benefits cut. And the uh, Iowa Department of Medicare said, we can't tell you, it's a trade secret. So we, lost, we filed a lawsuit figuring we would just find the trade secret. And as part of that lawsuit, we, uh, we had experts come in and we discovered that they were using a spreadsheet asking like 30 questions. It was really just a spreadsheet. But uh, when we tried to figure out what the logic was, we found out A, that the data that, that they used to construct the spreadsheet and, and the logic of the algorithm was flawed. The data was flawed. It was selectively used, et cetera. And that every time we asked different people in the, in, how they had come up with this logic of this spreadsheet algorithm, um, it ended up being a exercise in circular finger pointing. Everybody in the organization was pointing to somebody else, and everybody figured that it must be, you know, real and true because it's a computer. And we eventually uh, won the lawsuit and got a settlement. They promised to redo the, the spreadsheet, and you know, you you can't just take people's benefits away without telling them why. And you can see there again, it's just a spreadsheet, but a lot of the policy issues that come into play with governments using algorithms um, uh, in non-transparent ways. You know, were surfaced in this lawsuit. Right. So we see that there are different levels of abstraction and policy complexity and problems uh, that may replicate in certain contexts and maybe may differ also in different contexts. So does anybody in the room disagree with what these organizations have uh, put forward? Or does anybody want to add anything as to what artificial intelligence is? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. If you could also introduce like yourself. A little bit of a, of a mean question. So what? What is the difference between uh, AI and algorithm and just uh, a one-liner in the same dish. So, I mean, like, so, like, so, so what's the, the difference between programming and uh, like you know writing programs and using AI? What's the like? How do you distinguish this? I mean, one line you can draw is when you're getting into machine learning and opaque um, algorithms where you no longer can understand the logic. Um, and in, in theory, you know, that's the way our brains work, multiplied many times over what we are capable of today. And that raises, you know, uh, you know, separate policy issues apart from just the transparency of the logic and the soundness of the data, et cetera. Um, so I mean, that's one, it, it's definitional. And it's not clear how valuable it is to sort of declare that's AI and everything else isn't. But I, I, I think it matters because it's fine. One thing is code regulation, the other one is decision making regulation. This is like, in my point of view, that's two completely different things. What's the first one? One is like code or like, uh, like code regulations, which also include crypto, or maybe, maybe or like uh, uh, algorithms to use uh, that or something. And the other one is processes of making decisions. So I think the, um, the regulation question is a completely separate one from the definitional one. I think for us, and even sort of like even the IEEE, so the engineering and engineering society wrote, writes an report on ethically is ethically aligned design in both AI and autonomous systems. Super broad uh, spectrum of applications. So for us, the difference is an algorithm. You can see the code, uh, and the difference is if you if it becomes more complex, there's a moment of not unpredictability, but of interaction with the world um, in learning in learning systems. <laughs> of what makes programming difficult anyways. This is like, you know, we have lots of unsolved mathematical problems. Complexity theories are like this one, all kick in, of course. Right, uh, so there might be some different views with regards to the use uh, of um, AI and actually the, the process under which you actually regulate, uh, for example, code. Uh, but let's move a bit the discussion further. Uh, unless, uh, Javier from ORC, do you have a question? Particularly in the public sector, there is one the issue of the data, like training data, and the, the importance that the data that you're using will have in relation to the outcome. And that I think for me is one of the critical things, particularly when you look at the something that you're trying to understand how do you apply the public interest principle to the outcomes. And if you're looking at algorithms in many or AI as in affecting individual decisions. But it's also the idea of improving public policy and improving processes. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the use of AI in hospitals in the UK right now, 
the Google is for a contract with the medical with the health system where they claim all a all from say all the right ID in the process. So they own whatever improvements you make to hospital processes and in theory they belong to Google. It's remains system. It's true. The problem is that in this context, you know, the data, the use of that publicly funded data is critical to the you know to the outcome. As much at least as the actual initial revenue algorithm. So I think that for me that is something that for the private public sector is Right, so it's clear that uh, technology can be used for good and bad purposes. And so, uh, shall we move the discussion? Shall we continue? Yeah. Yeah. I, so we were kind of um, challenged with this question of thinking about drafting recommendations for the use of automated decision making by, by public, public authorities. And in my mind, I think whether that decision is being made through an Excel spreadsheet or a machine learning system or something more sophisticated than that, um, I think for us, even though these are mechanically and kind of in, in their underlying math different systems, I think um, we are right to think about governing them collectively as a set. I think the challenges posed by robotics and machine learning systems and other forms of algorithmic decision making are ultimately from a governance standpoint um, shared, shared ideas. So I think if we're going to be thinking about governing these kind of systems of, uh, of autonomous deci automated decision making rather, I think it would behoove us to take a step back and to just consider the full extent of, um, of their scope, what are they capable of? Right now, what are we using them for? So I thought it'd be informative to just look at a couple of examples right now. So predictive policing is a big one. I'm sure we'll hear more about it. Um, this past summer, this past fall, the Metropol Metropolitan Police in the UK tried for the second year in a row to use a facial recognition system to find sus suspects at the Notting Hill Carnival. Um, it resulted in 35 false matches and one false arrest. Um, Self-driving cars, this is perhaps more of a public-private kind of partnership. Um, I woke up this morning to a headline about uh, a Tesla that got into an accident just outside of LA this morning, and um, its autopilot system was on. It was going, I guess in Europe, 100 kilometers per hour and hit a fire truck, and the fire department tweeted about it and, and had a hashtag, distracted driving. Thankfully, no one was, was harmed, no one was hurt, but um, you know, when we think about all this data protection legislation that we want to exist, in that world, how would we want that risk to be distributed? How is that risk financialized? I think that this is a question that we have to think about as well. Um, public transit, um, if any of you have been to London and taken the tube, the company that takes care of when you top up the money on your Oyster card, um, that's a company called Cubic. It's contracted by Transport for London. Um, it, is experimenting always with ways of helping people move to the city more effectively, um, and recently has been experimenting with palm vein scanning. Um, this same company is contracted by US Armed Forces um, and also works on predicting the risk of landslides on highways. This is a kind of automated decision making that's in use today that I think we need to consider when talking about this topic as well. Um, iris scanning of refugees. 85% um, of refugees from the Syrian crisis um, seek asylum in Jordan, and they are enrolled through a program um, set up in partnership with UNHCR to have their irises scanned. And this allows them to gain access to basic social services, to withdraw money from ATMs. They don't have to worry about um, having a card or losing a card to access these services. Um, and 2.3 million refugees are in this system. Um, and of course, the process of eye scanning is an automated decision-making process and system itself. Um, mail sorting. So a lot of states, when you, submit, when you send in snail mail, um, the process of reading your, and processing your address and, and sorting and triaging that mail is, goes through an automated decision-making process. Um, public education, this is, I think, probably more applicable in the US than in Europe, but teachers are, um, scored by algorithms, and these, the outputs of, the, of these algorithms help decide who is promoted and who's fired. Um, and health information as well. Um, when the Zika virus broke out in Brazil in 2015, government entities from all over the world were using computational models and outcomes from automated decision-making systems to evaluate guidelines for um, recommendations made to pregnant women. This is part of the automated decision-making systems that we live with today. Um, and defense as well. I mean, there are a lot of public records of this all over the world, but um, they're really sophisticated mathematical systems that 
are used to simulate how ballistic missiles will, what the, the trajectories of ballistic missiles. And I think that um, when we're talking about this topic, it's easy to think that this is all just predictive policing. But in fact, this topic encompasses topics as mundane as mail sorting as well. And I think that we ought to be considering those when, when thinking about a system that's this big. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. This is pretty, pretty, um, should we do questions at the end? Or? No, 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 that's fine. Yeah. yeah, so now if, yeah. if it's okay, then we do like a, a brief uh, initial remarks and then I want to include you, everyone, as much as possible, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, um, this is pretty self-explanatory. You kind of, everyone here is familiar with the pros and cons. Um, the famous statistician from the 20th century, George Box, said all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this process of thinking about what are the, what are the pros and cons of these systems that we live with and how can we maximize their benefits while minimizing the costs is, not to be too meta, but this is actually a lot about how you think about designing algorithms themselves. Um, this is you know, the optimization principle. How can we maximize the benefits here while minimizing the costs? And I think, broadly speaking, in the interest of time, there are five main challenges that come up when, when I think about these, these challenges, justice and equality. Um, whom are we designing the systems for? Who are we not designing for? Um, certification, you can probably think regulation falls under this umbrella. Privacy, of course. Job security, um, what are the effects of pub on public finances of robots who don't pay taxes? Machines that might be, able to, might be taking over the, the jobs of people who do pay taxes. I think this is part of this question as well. And of course, the application of force too. So, you know, mail sorting is inherently a very different question from designing you know, and, and, and predicting the trajectories of ballistic missiles. And I think we need a framework to differentiate these. And um, I think things like transparency and fairness and accountability are, should be cross-cutting in our consideration of each of these technologies. So you could imagine a state using an automated decision-making system that could be evaluated by some kind of framework looking something like this. You know, is it explainable? Is it transparent? Is it fair across all these different dimensions? We've been talking a lot about algorithmic auditing certification today. Um, I've, my background is in data science, um, so I think really quickly some questions to think about when we do evaluate these algorithms, what does that process look like? What questions do we ask? So first, you know, there's training data that algorithms are built on. How relevant is this data? How representative is it? Is it? How, how sound is that information? And what proofs or tests are there to to substantiate those claims, how reproducible is it to begin with? Data cleaning in the real world, a lot of doing work with data and building predictive systems is cleaning data. You know, whose information are you including? Who's are you excluding? How are you dealing with outliers? How are you imputing cases that are missing? How are you defining success? You know, if we also proxies versus direct observations, if you are going to be introducing an approximation for something instead of that thing itself what potential errors could be introduced, and as well, what, what biases could be produced as well. Um, of course, mathematically, what algorithm are you using? What assumptions are you making behind the algorithm? Also, how's the model calibrated? This is important really as, well, as well. What's the optimization threshold you're using? Um, how's it updated? Was it last trained three years ago, or is it still going through kind of regular updates? How are the er errors distributed? What unintended consequences might your automated decision-making system have? and what feedback loops might it be contributing to. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll probably just, one last comment on the slide. I think um, information asymmetry is, a, in my mind, a recurring theme when thinking about these things. You know, to have a state, to have a public entity using an algorithmic decision system that you can't know or see is a lot like, in my mind, to having a law in the Constitution that you can't read. Um, and I think throughout thinking about designing the solutions to this problem, these information asymmetries pop up everywhere, something that we should be considering. Um, and lastly, I'll just mention too, I think in this, in the effort to solve this problem, we really need tech savvy journalists as well. Um, I think, you know, legislation is great, yes, introducing more rules, but having people to keep some eyes on the problem as well. Okay, one last comment, I promise, and then I'll be done. Um, also, I think to take a step back, um, you know, there are dynamics about governing AI systems that we should be thinking about, or automated decision-making systems, yes, for sure, but, you know, we also ought to be thinking about, are we trying to force a technical solution to a problem that's inherently social or environmental or political? I think that's part of this consideration as well. All right.
Thanks. Uh, brilliant. Uh, so you put forward several examples, uh, especially in the UK, uh, brought several pros and cons of using uh, AI. And so to the best of my knowledge, Stell wants to focus uh, on another member state of the EU. Are you going to talk us through what's happening in France? Sure. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, my name is Estelle from Axis. I don't know if I said that earlier. Um, so, I'm going to do a short presentation on the approach uh, from France on AI and hopefully use that example to show some of um, the issue we need to think about when we discuss um, AI. So, France started to ha develop a strategy on AI um, over the past few years, but is currently in the process of doing a new strategy um, done, uh, done by the government. There is a lot of focus on uh, research and boosting research in France on AI. Um, this is not necessarily entirely um, a surprise when we see the large amount of uh, companies' investment in France regarding AI. It started in 2014 when Huawei invested in a huge big data facilities. Then it was followed by Facebook who created its AI lab in 2015. And just yesterday at a massive conference, called uh, Choose France, uh, Google and Facebook announced that they will be spending $3.2 million uh, in France for AI research and financing research center and in, in the objective to train 100,000 people a year on the use of AI. Concretely, what does it mean and what's happening in those research centers, we don't know. Uh, we're only seeing that there is a large amount of uh, companies' money pouring into the country on that topic, which means that there is also uh, pressure on the lawmakers to have some sort of um, statement or action on AI, which uh, can also have an implication on our rights to data protection, privacy, and on discrimination. It's interesting to see that already in the uh, consultation that just happened on French level on the AI strategy, which talked a lot about um, AI and ethics, but had no references to human rights at all or to protection existing um, in certain framework, there were um, loose references to uh, the general data protection regulation and how maybe it could be adapted to the AI context. But it's um, it's quite interesting to see that when we're talking about um, possible regulation of AI or what can be done in the use of AI, government are really eager to use the word ethics, sort of interchangeably instead of the uh, human rights framework. And that might be problematic because ethics are highly subjective and we can have a philosophical debate on whichever of behavior we think is ethical or not, but ultimately human rights framework are here and we've all agreed upon, and uh, changing ethics for AI, uh, changing ethics for human rights or vice versa is problematic because we have a set of framework that is agreed, but because ethic is such a really nice buzzword and seems like we're caring about users by using those words, we're putting aside human rights and that might be a problem. So I think one of the first issue we need to put back when we discuss this is trying to assess how these development interact with, with our human rights. Then we've seen a lot of proposal in uh, regulating, not necessarily regulating code, but targeting uh, publicity of an um, algorithm in as equivalent of transparency. So there was famous amendment in the French parliament of, uh, well, Google needs to have, Google have the obligation to publish its algorithm. Um, so that's very interesting, uh, how exactly it's going to be useful for me as a user to have access to the Google algorithm and how is it going to empower me and how am I going to be more informed about how algorithm function, et cetera, et cetera, is a problem. But at the same time, we're not having a discussion on what's the impact of those algorithms and maybe that's where we should focus our attention. So there is some of those discussion that already happened uh, in data protection legislation, in privacy legislation. Uh, we now have under the GDPR a right to object to a processing solely based on algorithm and I think this is something that is actually quite important when we see that there is a push from public authorities to more and more use AI to make decisions on that basis about us, knowing that we have the right to tell that public authority, I do not want you to use an algorithm but I want a human to take the decision so I can be able to understand how the decision has been made is also important. Not to say that we can't get to a point where AI might be useful, but we also need to understand that you don't have an obligation to have the AI taking a decision about you all the time. Um, so I think the French example is interesting in the sense of many steps that are being um, forwarded on just trying to embrace AI because it's a new cool thing and trying to think in an ethical way because it's also a really nice buzzword, but we're not getting back into the situation of first assessing what would be the implication for users and society as a whole, and how could we tackle 
those issues first, what AI means also, what do what is the research gonna be focused on and just to add a, a layer of difficulty on what is happening, we are also having a lot of questions on the use of open data and whether company data should be poured into that. But a lot of this debate also negate the fact that um, when we're talking about that, most of the time lawmakers are actually not talking about open data, but are talking about personal data, the company that processed about us and that they want to put in an open database, uh, which is slightly different, and we are the owner of that data. So there is a lot of issues in terms we're talking about and a lot of step being uh, skipped, but that's, uh, that's a little bit where we are. And in terms of concrete action happening in France, there is uh, a law uh, on the table at the moment, which is generally quite positive, implementing the general data protection regulation, but has an interesting approach on its article and algorithm, uh, because it wants to use the GDPR as a way to influence the, to, um, sorry, to expand the use of AI by public authority. Um, which is uh, by changing a little bit the objective of one article, which is quite interesting. So we definitely see a lot of interest coming from France, which the reason why I'm warning you about that is not that I'm overly obsessed by my home country. It's just like, unfortunately, a lot of the thing that France does is then being brought to Brussels and then taken into different proportions. So just an early warning that this is happening and maybe it's worth taking a look at. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Estelle, for these. Uh, so now we're going to go a bit further. So we're going to cross the Atlantic and see what's happening in the US. Uh, thanks to Jan from ACLU. Thanks. So, um, you know, the way that these issues hit the ACLU a lot of the time is we get a call from reporters. Um, and we have lawsuits. So we're, we're investigating, litigating around these issues. Um, but we also have a lot of power to just affect the public discourse and, and speak out about you know, and raise questions about things. And often it takes the form of, we get a press call, there's this government agency, they're using uh, algorithms in this way, what do you think? Um, for example, I got a call, this department, uh, this bureaucracy in New York City was gathering lots and lots of data from all different New York City agencies about New York City residents, compiling it all together and running an algorithm on it to try to predict who was likely to be evicted and the people who were likely to be evicted would get extra assistance and aid. Well, that's not, I mean, often algorithms are, you know, are put in scary terms. It's like, oh, all these potentials to do evil things. Well, here it's helping people. So how do we evaluate that? Um, and so I have, you know, thinking about that and other issues, I have, um, and, and all the amazing thinking that's been done about um, algorithms um, and AI, and I've made a bold, perhaps foolhardy attempt to come up with six questions that I think should be asked of a governmental use of AI um, that can help us as an initial stab at a framework to help us evaluate, is this something that we think is an acceptable use of AI and algorithms by public authorities? The first one is the threshold question. Is it transparent? Obviously, there's a whole bunch of tricky questions there. It, maybe you could say, is it transparent as far as, as possible? Um, that's a threshold question. I agree with the focus on transparency. When I am asked about algorithms, I just say transparency, transparency, transparency. It's so new. Um, there's the, the novelty around it. We don't know how it's playing out. We, obviously, there's all kinds of questions about the underlying data. And often, there are value judgments that are, that are made in the process of creating these systems that, that the public needs to know about. So once you get past that threshold question, there's two other questions that need to be balanced against each other. Number one, how accurate is the algorithm and its predictions slash how um, effective is it in reaching the goals that it's designed to do? And how much does accuracy matter? Um, the, the less that accuracy matters, the more tolerance you can have for inaccuracy. Um, how accurate is the algorithm and its predictions? Are there problems with the data behind the AI? Is it biased? Is it inaccurate? Is it irrelevant or is it otherwise flawed? Are there um, problems with the logic behind the AI? Does it, you know, does it merely reflect the biases um, and the unconscious premises of its creators? Does it, does it incorporate spurless correlations, et cetera, et cetera? So there's a measurement of how accurate the algorithm is in doing what it claims to do and achieving the goals that it claims to achieve. But the next question is, how much does the accuracy actually matter? What are the consequences? So, and under that, there's four sub-questions. What consequences flow to those who are misidentified by the algorithm? If the algorithm makes errors, does it mean that 
people get thrown in prison or get longer prison sentences or are denied benefits? Or does it mean that you know, good things maybe go to the people who aren't completely optimal, but like nobody's really hurt? That makes a big difference in how you uh, evaluate an algorithm. Um, what are the consequences to, to others? Maybe if good things are going to the wrong people, certain people are really, really suffering because they're not getting the A that they, that they should get. That's another question. What does the program replace? Um, this is a big question. Like, uh, you know, off, often we see this in uh, the criminal justice context. People complain about potential uh, unfairness in um, algorithms around um, bail and, and probation, et cetera. But if, the, if what it's replacing is some racist southern judge pulling his biases out of his ear, then even a biased algorithm might be better than what you had before. Um, and then the fourth sub-question there was, is what institutional incentives are at work? Institutional incentives matter. If you have a public service agency whose mission is to help people, then I think that you have to worry a little bit less about the agency going out of control than an agency where the, the, the goals of the agency are directly at odds with the people who are the subjects of the algorithmic decision making, such as a law enforcement agency. Um, and so, you know, I think that you have to do that balancing. How accurate and effective is the algorithm and how much does the accuracy matter? Um, and then beyond that, there are other questions that are, you know, have been much, much discussed. Um, how just is the algorithm? An algorithm can be accurate and can be valid and can still be unjust. Uh, obviously, there's racism, uh, sexism, but uh, one example I always point to is the man who had his credit limit lowered, even though he paid it in full every month, he called them up and said, why was my credit limit lowered? And they said, the other customers at some of the stores that you've been shopping at have had bad credit, so we're lowering yours. He had, he had not done anything wrong. And this, I think, is where machine learning really brings in the potential, because machine learning can detect very subtle and sometimes surprising correlations in theory. Um, and it's possible that we may be penalized for things that are not wrong and that we can't at all predict. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, we may end up with algorithms that are unjust because they just penalize people for surprising and irrational things. Um, two more, the last two questions, number five, what kind of side effects does the algorithm have? Uh, you know, New York City's algorithm in term, may gather data to help people lower the eviction rate for poor people, but maybe all the data that they're collecting, number one, has maybe it incentivizes the collection of data that, that, that agencies wouldn't normally gather. Um, and maybe the agency is generating scores for people, and those scores could then be um, used in secondary ways. They could be um, stigmatizing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, even, a, even an algorithm that meets the other criteria could have bad side effects. And then finally, number six, um, are there adequate due process and redress sort of escape valves here? Because um, no set of rules is ever going to capture what you're trying to achieve. There will always be, um, the, the, real, the real world is so complicated that um, any set of rules that you try to um, construct to create a certain outcome will be broken by certain real world circumstances where um, the rules are followed and yet the outcome is something that everybody agrees is unfair or not what is desirable. And so you always need, in any automated system, effective, um, redress and um, due process uh, mechanisms. So that's the uh, the super quick um, tour of, of, of what, what I hope is an, at least an initial stab at coming up with a, a way to try and come up with some organization for how to think about the many, many policy issues in this area. Uh, thank you so much for these uh, six key questions to ask uh, governments when using AI. Uh, so finally, but not least, uh, Federica from Price International, what's, what's your take on all of this? Yes, thank you, So I think we have now been using the word algorithm and AI interchangeably, and that's mm -hmm. a problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to read out sort of the definition that we use when in submissions and policy documents. So artificial intelligence or intelligence, artificial intelligence or intelligence systems which can act without being specifically programmed to follow certain steps or instructions. This in itself is a term that's used in very different contexts. And the examples are anything from machine learning, which makes inferences, predictions, and decisions about individuals, other domain-specific AI algorithms, to fully autonomous and connected objects. This is still a very broad range, but we can't just 
interchangeably used, I think, algorithm with AI. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, I, but it's saying that I... Um, so why is it important to think about the use in the public sector? I think, first of all, our expectations of the public sector are different, mm -hmm. in that we often can't opt out. Um, uses in public sector often, not always, uh, affect those that are already marginalized. I'm thinking law enforcement, health services, social services. Uh, they're often tax funded, so we have an expectation that they don't have a disparate impact, so to say. Um, Often, pub, not always, public sector applications are high stakes, and this is something Andrew Selbs came up with last week. So high stakes decisions are ones where we have a very low outlier tolerance, where we don't want uh, errors to happen at all. Um, there are often legal differences between public and private sectors. For example, in data protection law, there are often excep exceptions on grounds of national security. Um, however, where data protection laws are applicable, public authorities can't rely on processing for legitimate interests that companies can do. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. You can uh, do freedom of information requests on public authorities, not on companies. Um, and there are often different legal requirements such as procur procurement procedures that have some degree of transparency in that domain at least. Um, so in a way, they're also often being employed very differently than in the private sector. Some, some uh, countries have a tradition of building in-house system this is something that Michael Veal, who is also here, is working on. And in other, case, other cases, uh, public sector has no expertise at all and is completely relying on outsourcing um, such as in like, the predictive policing context. Uh, so it's in a way, it is a lot is at stake, but at the same time, it's also actually an opportunity to establish a framework as civil society to say, those are the conditions in which we would like these systems to be used. Um, so what's our position? So I think. The definitional challenge is a challenge. Um, so what we have done is sort of like identified four dimensions of current and future applications where we see privacy invasion, because that's what we do. Um, in general, I would say the privacy implications of AI stem from its ability to detect, detect patterns in data, and at the same time, its reliance on massive amounts of data for training purposes or input. Um, so the four domains we're looking at. The first one is any applications of AI that are used to identify or track individuals. So that will be facial recognition in public spaces, uh, the use of machine learning to identify or re-identify individuals in pseudonymized data, for example. Um, a second application is the use of AI applications to make or inform decisions. And I use the frame to make or inform because um, the decision itself doesn't have to be automated for there to be problems. And I can give you an example. Um, sorry, just in a short intersection for the mail sorting problem. I think the decisions we talk about are very specific decisions. They are one, cons uh, decisions that have a, a, a great consequence for people. And the GDPR language of significant or legal effects might be actually quite useful. Um, there are decisions about individuals and about their environment. The second one, I'm not, that's maybe a bit more tricky, but let's say if I personalize uh, the information you see, that's a decision about what you're exposed to, not necessarily about you. Um, and the reason why I say make or inform is, let me give you two examples. Um, we wouldn't want a system to decide who goes to jail, but if I assign a threat score to an individual, and then the judge who makes the decision has no technical expertise or um, ability, because there the are trade secrets, to interrogate where the score came from, whether it's uh, discriminatory or anything, uh, such a score can have huge impact on the actual decision that is being made. Um, and then, so like decision making is the third. Another one application that we are concerned about is the use of machine learning to rank, score, or classify individuals. I already gave the one of the individual level threat score, um, also in predictive policing. But another interesting example is the NSA Skynet program that used, according to the Snowden documents, machine learning algorithms to rate phone users in Pakistan on their likelihood of being a terrorist. This has been reported as this machine learning algorithm kills people. We know that this is not the case. There are other procedures in place. But I still think it's interesting what are the consequences of people being given a score or classified in a certain way 
even if the decision itself is not made by the system. And finally, autonomous embodied systems, so that would be, um, I think Germany's st uh, strategy on self-driving and autonomous cars is interesting, because it has an, a section on data protection and privacy as well. Do I have time? Uh, one minute. One minute for a recommendation. <laughs> so I, I think this is a very complex topic, and we as an organization don't have a position yet. I find it difficult to say, let's regulate AI, because what are we talking about? However, um, it is important to say that data protection laws, especially in countries that don't have them, are really relevant um, because they regulate, on the one hand, the data that feeds into systems that is used for input and training purposes, but with provisions like profiling in the GDPR, they also talk about the data that, data that is being generated as an output. So if I profile you as, I think you're depressed, or I think you're liberal, I think you're conservative, those are new data points. Um, that again have to be, can only be processed uh, lawfully and fairly. However, data protection doesn't cover it all. As I said before, there are often exceptions for public bodies, such as in the UK currently, the UK wants to have an exception for political parties, uh, interestingly, uh, not blanket, but for certain profiling provisions that we're fighting. However, it's also important to know that the, the privacy effects that I described, they don't just apply to personal data, they apply to mass, to groups of people, I can uh, predict movement riots, uh, movements of riots in the streets. You can use privacy conversing technologies and use non-personal data, and it can still be invasive. Um, so I think it's important to also think about sectoral regulation, about privacy, not about AI in general. Um, and if I can say this for 20 seconds more, mm -hmm. I think <laughs> that was actually my main point, well planned. Um, <laughs> Yes. There are a lot of discussions about how the technology should be built, used, and applied, in which context. So there are discussions about auditability, slash explainability, slash sometimes called transparency, uh, discussions about fairness, discrimination, when or when not you need human intervention. I think all of these are very context-specific, and it's important maybe for civil society to work out what requirements we have for each public sector use and context. However, one thing we should talk about more is under which conditions and what kinds of AI uh, should not be employed at all. Mm -hmm. And so there are discussions about safety critical systems. And a term that came up in a discussion in a, at the Turing Institute last week was, what about uh, human rights critical systems? What do we think about, what are the conditions where we think failure would have such effects on people's liberties that we need extra safeguards or extra, maybe we are not, maybe we are not, com maybe we're not comfortable with very complex systems where auditability is so challenging that we don't know if people's rights have been infringed. Right. Thank you so much. Aren't you impressed with these interventions? I mean, we heard uh, many challenges that uh, AI uh, brings. We also heard about many challenges that algorithms uh, bring. We talked about justice equality, privacy uh, problems, and uh, Frederica just mentioned four dimensions <coughs> where we have privacy intrusions. Uh, we also uh, heard about the different uh, questions that should be asked uh, by governments before taking any decision on using or resorting to uh, any kind of technology. We also uh, discussed a bit uh, um, that we shouldn't use interchangeably uh, concepts that mean different things, like algorithms and artificial intelligence. We see that we also need to look at the fact that before thinking about providing technical solutions, we should think about whether uh, there's actually an inherent uh, so a social problem, as everyone was saying. Uh, we have shown several examples, so now it's your turn. What do you think about this? Do you have any recommendation or any counter recommendation uh, to the ones that you've heard before? Uh, when you uh, want to make an intervention, please state your name and speak loudly. Yes, uh, we have the first one. Uh, my name is Luis. Um, I almost heard something, but uh, I think it was, uh, I didn't hear accountability in the mm -hmm. end. We are speaking about intelligence, trying to define what is intelligent, but we are not speaking about the artificial. In the, there is a person behind every artificial intelligence. There is somebody not only who coded, but who made a logical scheme, taking some decisions. Decisions that then are automated by the artificial intelligence. So who is responsible for the, I wouldn't say the wrong or the errors of an artificial intelligence, but 
for the decisions of an artificial intelligence. Because at this point, um, we don't have similarity. We don't have a personality of an artificial intelligence. We have public administrations, which by nature should be accountable, employing a tool. It might be a hammer or it might be a computer program. So uh, Christian's question was regarding accountability. Uh, so who, uh, there's always pers uh, people behind uh, artificial intelligence. So who's responsible for the decisions that are being taken with regards to AI? Do you want to I mean, say something? It's been noted by political philosophers that one of the horrors of the 20th century is that is that it were increasingly ruled by bureaucracies. And one of the horrors of bureaucracies is that it's very hard to pinpoint a person who's accountable because they are, accountability is diffuse. Um, because uh, bureaucracies um, exhibit emergent qualities where you get a bunch of smart ethical people together in a building and they end up collectively being emergently evil and dumb. Um, and, uh, and I think that in, in many ways, you know, computer programs, I mean, bureaucracies are information processing algorithms. You know, you fill in the form, it goes through the machine, they make you, they give you your decision and um, in many ways, uh, you know, it's very hard to come up with an accountability other than the department. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole uh, other dimension of machine learning, which means that there isn't somebody who's sitting there designing a lot, putting a logic into it, um, which adds a whole nother. And then, in some ways, you know, the scrutiny um, falls more on the, the data. The data becomes the algorithm in those cases. So. Thank you. The um, building on actually what you said about. Um, the, the distinction sort of like with, with human intervention or the, where, where the, where's the system actually better? The, uh, a good example is always hiring. When people hire you, the process is always usually very opaque, the decision-making process that goes on in people's brains. You can reverse engineer and find out whether this was statistically, there are statistically unfair practices, but the rationale behind is often very difficult to find out. Um, I just lost the... Um, yes, I think you were first. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, so I was hearing more transparency so a lot, which is lovely. Um, I'm wondering um, if you can. I'm uh, wondering if what you mean is pretty solid uh, when you speak of transparency, because if, uh, I think we have algorithms and AI systems, uh, software that is not free software. So, okay. so I'm just wondering is like, you know, whoever is it on an institutional level, are people saying we need free software or are they saying we need transparency? Because I think the free software and the free software foundation have been since the 80s playing exactly what the free and free software. So I'll repeat the question for those that will be seeing this video recording or for those that didn't hear it. The question uh, was regarding what do we mean by transparency? Do we uh, mean free software or do we mean something else? There are different sources of opacity. It can be on the one hand, if you use proprietary software and the com as you described in your cases and the company says we, don't, we can't reveal any logic, this is a form of opacity. But there are, there are different sources of opacity, and I think you can make the argument in specific contexts where there are great consequences. It would be, I would find it counterintuitive that governments can rely on services by companies who then can claim we can't tell you anything about how this decision has been created. Mm -hmm. That being said, the previous panel, did, there was a very good discussion about what does explainability or auditability are maybe better terms than transparency and different stakeholders require different degrees of it and maybe or different kinds. So if, if I audit something, I need different information, then I, in a legal case, you need different information than you need as a user when you agree to sign up to something. I just want to add something, I think to bring it into the last question and, and Frederica's point earlier about the, the hiring practice example. To me, these are both kind of generalizations of this information asymmetry phenomenon I was talking about earlier. I, and you know, I think something can be, you know, you can have a system that's explainable and non-transparent and, and the other way around as well. I think in the case of accountability, the reason I brought up the Tesla example is because it, it is this question of where, where does that accountability lie? And I think um, when you have a system that's totally opaque, 
Um, it's inherently connected to the governing or the oversight system as well, right? Like if I buy a yogurt today or if I buy something in the grocery store, there's some kind of basic food safety standards that have to, has to go through. And, and when the E. coli breaks out, for instance, you know, it's part that, that onus is partly on the governing oversight body and partly on the organization itself producing that. And I think a very similar system could exist in the world of algorithms as well. Maybe I'll take three questions and then, yes, so Felix? Yeah. Uh, Felix, my question was for the personal data protection experts out there, which I'm not uh, wondering uh, to what extent will we find legal resources in the GDPR or the directive on the use of uh, personal data by like, public like authority for the personal data process? Do you remember the acronym? Yeah. Do we have yeah, legal tools in these texts, uh, European texts, to go against the deployment of AI systems, and you're thinking especially for surveillance purposes? Uh, so, Felix was asking about the GDPR uh, and whether there are any legal resources to fight against um, you know, surveillance uh, by, or the increase of surveillance by public authorities. Um, who leads that? Can answer? Estelle? Um, so it's a bit difficult because um, the way the GDPR was designed, unfortunately, also sorry, also includes a lot of exception, which includes uh, public security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the law enforcement will argue that their activity falls outside of the scope of the GDPR, but that's not, in my opinion, entirely true. And there is still a lot of provision that applies. So I think there is model case that can be built. Whether or not they'll be successful is a question, but. There are still basic rules of the GDPR that needs to apply, even though you're using it for the exception, one of the exception uh, of the law. So there is rule on data security. There is uh, also if you devi deviate from the the user's right, which include the right to object to an automated processing, for instance, there is a need to justify this and to balance fundamental rights. So there is pro difficult case law to be built, but. I think the possibility exists and it might require a lot of legal brains uh, and data protection experts to think about it, but I don't think it's impossible, uh, even though from the other side we might hear that it's totally out of the scope and don't ever try it, but I'd say it's the first ring. Fukami uh, and then Roko. Yeah, uh, general, I, I like the discussion in terms of there are so many different aspects and in my point of view, one very big misunderstanding. Um, because I have a feeling that policymakers have a feeling that AI and algorithms are something like you know, something magic that you apply to something and then it works. Mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, is not in line with what I see in my daily life. It is more like people throw technology together and you know they might end up using TensorFlow, but it is not that they really use AI. You know, so because it just solves the technical problem, it doesn't mean that they you know like going to implement a certain algorithm, say solve a problem. And you and, and, and this is my point, this is basically a business model that they fulfill. So it is less about how it things are implemented, it's uh, which what purpose. And it doesn't like and, and if you want to go for regulation topics, I'm fine with it. But I but I'm but I worry that you uh, go too much into something that doesn't that shouldn't be regulated like this. So for example, you say it doesn't matter if there is like an Excel sheet or let's say you know, uh, the TensorFlow based image uh, uh, um, uh, analysis, it's a huge difference. The huge difference is that I might even trust AI more than a person that is able to change uh, uh, an Excel sheet in order to change the outcome of an election. You know, like the, 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 the thing is like that it is engineering questions. It is not what you think as, uh, as an, an algorithm or AI. The AI part is just, uh, uh, it solves a technical purpose, but it is not the solution to something. This is still programming, and it will always be, because it is built with a proposal of doing something specific. Thank you. And I find that that, that uh, decision, uh, the, the, the definition, very nice in terms of saying that when we talk about AI, we talk about something very specific. 
this is something where we where we take data and we don't know the outcome. Bugs are not what's meant with this. You know, we have a lot of bugs and we don't understand technology for a different reason. But this means something else. This means a purpose to see something that we couldn't see in any other way, and it's like the outcome of, you know, like, uh, so, so not so much, you know, like, pure implementation. Right, so the remarks are quite clear. Before I let the panelists respond, I would like to take the question of Rocco. Maybe to bridge a little bit of yep. what Fukami was saying. I think that Jay used the word substitution and to focus on what, uh, I don't know how to, to call it now, algorithm IE, let's call it something like that, gets into and sometimes maybe instead of an Excel sheet you have a much more complex algorithm or a social technical system. And I think that maybe substitution are as a focus of the yeah, or, yeah, or, or, or if statistics. Um, but we don't. We know that also within statistics, uh, not all the systems are the same. And to move from one to the other, substitute uh, and in substituting something, we are modifying the purpose. So we are modifying the kind of actors that are participating, and so on. Like to 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 put it not very philosophically, but very practical. Like the introduction of a more automated uh, system to check uh, uh, energy consumption for identifying if you are lying or not in your social security claims about how many people are living in your place, change the relation in which you are. You are no more going to speak with a, an employee or of the state that may be more or less sympathetic, that may know also other elements within the wider picture, but you will be brought before a number. And this, this assumption. So since that focus on, that on the substitution rather than our critical infrastructure that we do not want to go and touch, it, it may be <coughs> richer for, for, for in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, getting a deeper understanding of uh, what we are speaking about. Because it's not only the technique, it's also the kind of people that are going to be moved in. It's the fact that uh, private companies are going to play a role where before they were not playing a role. And so so I, I don't know what you think about this idea of, for example, substitution. So how things are going to change by the introduction of this. Right, so if I may summarize, uh, is there such a thing as cyber magic? Uh, and uh, Fukami was making the point that basically um, there's, uh, it's not just about implementation of AI but actually the purpose uh, of it and who's behind it and the, there's a lot of engineering questions uh, and then AI may not be the solution uh, for everything. And Rocco's point was that we need a deeper understanding and we need to identify which roles and uh, he's basically asking what do you think uh, about the concept of substitution? Who wants to respond uh, to these? Uh, I guess I'm still not clear on the points. I mean, are you saying, Fugami, that like, so the technology is iterated, it's constantly changing and being, people are experimenting with it, so you can't really pin it down to sort of one technology that you can then analyze according to like the kind of framework that I'm putting in place, and that really you should be focused on the goals of the technology in terms of judging it not on the more granular questions that I was asking. Is that was that your point? So, so the approach like in data protection regulation, that you have mm -hmm. like a uh, like a clear purpose, that you have like a clear, uh, a much clearer description of what's what in what like in what frame uh, these things should actually be uh, 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 allowed or not or like. Uh, uh, require oversight or something like this. And it's like, you know, te technology changes so, so quickly that one, 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 uh, it's always a good thing to, to, to think in terms as, you know, like non-technical or non-implementation non specific mm -hmm. in terms of technical implementation. So if I say, I take again, you know, like uh, machine learning library as an example, if you put that into law, then you have also a big problem when people start to say it's not a machine learning algorithm anymore, it's something else. So you need to come up with something much higher level in order to make clear what you want to have. Well, you want to have I don't think I was proposing any kind of granular regulation of the mechanisms of the AI. I was saying you need to be as transparent as possible. You need to figure out whether yeah, it's effective. Absolutely. Like, if, if you want to, if you want to identify people who are like really high insurance risks, is it is it actually effective at that, or are you identifying a bunch of people who are actually low insurance risk, and so it's not even working? And versus, how much does it matter if it's not working? 
Those are pretty high level questions, aren't they? These are high level. Yeah, but, but I, I don't want to have like bilateral right. discussions. Right. Okay, but sorry. I want to let the other panelists to speak and maybe other people of the audience speak if you mind to also. Do you want to complement anything? Uh, I mean, on Fukami's point, I think in the EU we have made the mistake in the past to have legislation specifically targets to some sort of um, technology. I mean, that has created problem uh, in privacy laws, for instance. We had a whole regulation that was supposed to fix the impact of tracking, but talk so much about cookies that people mm -hmm. have it as the cookie legislation, which mm -hmm. now is being reformed and trying to change on like, okay, what is supposed to be regulated is the impact of tracking on people and how this impact their right to privacy. It's not regulating a piece of technology that might uh, leads to tracking. So hopefully we learn from those mistakes, but I would, I would agree with what you said, that if the point is not to um, regulate a piece of code or a specific AI or or a specific even algorithm, but it's more like what is it used for and how to use it. And but even when we start from the <coughs> the first premise, the biggest problem we have from a starting point is that um, AI and well, actually, I'm going to talk here about algorithm or even machine learning. If you want them to function, you need to fill them with data and often a, a lot of data. And one of the core principle of data protection is data minimization that use as little data as possible. And how do you reconcile that? Is one of the biggest of the, one of the biggest problem. I don't it's quite clear, Federica. Do you want to compliment and maybe also reply to Rocco's uh, question? I don't want his question to be about substitution. I, I didn't quite understand that. To the previous question, I think um, where what I liked about the comparison with the exosheet is that AI can be used for automated decision making. There are other forms of automated decision making. Can also there's also automated decision making without AI and the harm can be equally big. Um, so sometimes people, we replace AI discussions about AI with discussions about automated decision making. So it's really important to point out you don't need AI to create harm. The exosheet can do the same harm. But, but my problem is I really, I really miss the, what's the specificity, what is the legal specificity or the political specificity or speaking in terms of AI? Like is because government and, and business is using it that we need to use it, yes. or, or can we be happy? And this also <laughs> yeah, we also use it, like like because an enormous amount of projects are all with AI actually. So this is like so I think that's it. The, the reason project. the reason why we got involved in this debate because it seemed like a big PR campaign last year. Suddenly everybody was talking about AI, and there's a lot of mentioning about ethics. Not, no human rights, no privacy, at least at the beginning. Uh, and, and, and in a sense, you're right, there's a reframing. Some of the things that have never been called AI are now called AI for marketing purposes, but also politically, strategically, for deregulation purposes, because it sounds exciting. Uh, in, from the UK, I can say the UK is really worried about the economic impact of Brexit, so there's a worry that we have to win the AI race was the conclusion of the official government report. So I think there are a lot of political things going on. That said, and also said that automation has many different problems regardless whether you use AI, there is something specific about the technology that is new and that poses human rights questions. And if you have, if you make a decision or if you classify people and it's, you, it's very difficult to explain how that you can maybe you can do the you can find out the weights that determined how somebody why somebody was classified X or Y, but when that explanation is not meaningful to you, this raises new questions. Sort of the question is, do we want to rely on such a system in a situation where it really matters when we make a mistake, like life or death decisions? Or that sounds really dramatic, but if you're poor not getting credit is, is a li can be life or death decision. So, so our unaccountable position by default mm -hmm. i.e. is a sign of the unaccountable because no. you cannot give a, a, an explanation that can be understood. Uh, if I understand well what you are meaning by yes. i.e. So the the in copyright, for example, is where you can see it. I mean, copyright is based on human agency and originality and there's a massive debate as to when you have copyright. Uh, works with it, that would be access to what agency is. So, so I think a, there is okay. still a very, very gray area. I wouldn't replace the word lack of explainability or auditability with accountability. I think those are, you can always blame someone. I could just say, if you employ it, it's your fault. But I think the, the, pro or the challenges that are novel is if you have complex systems that lead to results that are a bit unpredictable to both the designers of the systems and those that are affected, that's a new problem. Maybe not entirely new, but that the scale of the 
abdication is a problem, and then also sort of the uh, the, com the sheer complexity and the problem of yes, you can explain how the exosheet work, you can explain how an algorithm work, but a very complex system it's not always that difficult. At least that's what technical people say. Does anybody else uh, want to react to this, or has any other question? Yes. I have another uh, topic. Uh, if you can state your name. Yeah, my name is Tobias um, from Germany. Um, one problem I see with most machine learning uh, systems is uh, that uh, I want to come back to the model uh, system. You have a model that uh, tries to explain a lot of things, but you uh, don't have like a clear definition what's going in, uh, what are the, re uh, in what cases you have uh, uh, a valid uh, or what percentage uh, true um, reply out of this system. So uh, you're just doing some magic and not having scientific uh, in any way uh, um, an some kind of reliability in the system. You just uh, try to explain a lot of things and you don't know if it's working for that cases. And if you have a, a systematic error, the same person gets always discriminated based on this algorithm. And that can also be a problem for people that are not randomly. Another uh, point in this is uh, if you have a manual check, you have more likely 10, 20 people you check. If you uh, apply this on a big scale, then uh, the, foul, uh, the failure rate uh, uh, is uh, much different if I uh, apply it to a million people a day. And that's also a topic that uh, concerns automatic machine learning. So what do you think about these concerns, fellow panelists? I was following what you were saying. Can you clarify what your question is? Or, <laughs> I, mean, the yeah, I mean, the first case of kind of, a, this sounds like a really poorly designed algorithm that kind of sounds like bad news all around. It's not just poorly designed, but also unexplainable, unaccountable, not really transparent in any way. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that sounds like bad news all around. On the second question, if I'm understanding you correctly, I think, um, yeah, the mechanics of you know training a system on ten thousand people and then deploying it to ten million is it's different. It, it you know changes the way in which you construct the algorithm. But I I'm not sure if I understood your question about it's, that. It's also about the error rate. Mm -hmm. If you just manually check a few people and you have uh, one out of thousand that uh, got sorted out, then it's a problem. If you check everyone and you have one out of thousand, then it's a different scale uh, of the arrow. I mean, in my mind, the big issue here is the giant disconnect between the sophisticated, complex problems, the novelty of this, the rarity of, ex of true expertise on how to do this right and what right looks like, versus the Medicare Department of Idaho with a bunch of guys in a, who come up with something and they all think that it's valid because somebody else said it was valid in a circular, you know, the, and the lack of sophistication there. And that is the, you know, ultimately that's the danger that we are living in. And, you know, it's, it's why you, with all the tough questions around transparency and what exactly transparency is, that's why, I mean, we, we need to focus transparency, 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 so that, you know. We um, refer to the, to the uh, war uh, against science in the US. Sorry? We refer against war. Uh, the war against science? Uh, so, so, I mean, like, in general, this is like a point. Uh, you know, like, people that they work with statistics, they know what it means to change data there in order to make the statistic look like better or just only use a certain part of it. And with most of the AI, uh, like, I, like relay AI, I see, it's roughly like this to change your model and so you have a different outcome. So, in, and to judge um, which one is better over the other. I don't know if you like if it's really the discussion that is that easy because it means you know like uh, or like oh let's put it like this most of the time it's about money so uh, 
whom to take, like from whom you take the money away, from the poor or from the from the old or from the from the sick. So this is like a main thing that is happening there. Right. I will give the opportunity to you yeah. to you to respond and to Federica and then to your question. Yeah. You want to I don't have it. Yeah. Okay, Federica. Just a final thought. I think in addition to all discussions about how do we make systems more optimal and interpretable, how do we ma make sure they're discriminatory or not discriminatory and fair, whatever that means. Um, it is important to also talk about the fact that especially in, in public uses, there are many stupid ideas for AI <coughs> applications um, and that we should not be try to optimize these but say they're really stupid ideas. And one stupid idea is mm -hmm. use facial recognition to detect who uh, looks like a suspect and automatically ban them from places. That's just simply a bad idea. Um, and this is exactly what I meant earlier when I was talking about are we using technology as an instrument of something else or are we solving a technology problem with technology? And the same with like detecting homosexuality from faces is a bad idea, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and there were good critiques of that study, etc. So it would be interesting also to come up with together to collect these examples, to have a list, and because the, uh, police departments talk to each other, ideas are being shared, it's important to come up and say like this is just not Appropriate, an appropriate use of the technology for the purposes of a public institution. There's a wonderful quote from the uh, anthropologist Clifford Geertz, and he said something to the effect of, you know, once in a while, a big giant new idea bursts upon the scene, and everybody lashes onto it and tries to use it for everything and make everything fit into that idea, and um, and over time, people figure out that like what the idea is actually useful for and what it doesn't work so well for. And I think we're seeing that with AI and machine learning in particular, that everybody wants to use it for everything. And there's a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of, inevitably a lot of inappropriate and dumb uses of it. But, the, but well, over time, optimistically we might say, uh, we will figure out um, where it works and where it doesn't work and what kind of checks and balances or, or so forth that have to be in place. Or, I mean, maybe that's a functionalist view, like everything will work out fine in the end. Maybe. It, Maybe bureaucracies will latch onto horrible, unjust things, and, and that will perpetuate forever. I don't know. <laughs> you had a question or a yeah, remark. I had uh, one one question because I, I had the feeling that there is uh, an important. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm Julian from the University of Technology of Montaigne, uh, um, and so um, yeah. Uh, so there was one uh, point I had the feeling that wasn't really discussed, which is actually the point that a lot of these uh, efforts in intel um, intel uh, artificial intelligence is. Uh, it's in part driven by uh, the context of uh, uh, budget cuts uh, and so on. So basically, uh, for example, if you say, well, you can replace judges with an artificial uh, intelligence, well, that's great for the Justice Department because then they don't have to pay so many expensive people who spent years in college learning law and so on. It's, it's, it, it's cheaper to just have artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Also in France now, there is a big push to, uh, for surveillance for uh, welfare beneficiaries. So what is it useful for? Well, for example, in France, when you're in a couple, you get less welfare uh, payments. So of course, it's interesting to track uh, you know, who, um, who is in a couple and who isn't, and with all sorts of, course, of sensitive data that you can collect to determine whether you are in a couple or not. Um, and so this type of decision can be could be made by artificial intelligences on you know the who's in couple and who isn't, and then we can cut welfare. So this context of, of um, so there is this big context and big discourse and uh, applications of artificial intelligence being used um, for that purpose. Uh, and so my question is. Um, so at the end of the day, and I'm talking in English, I don't know if I'm very clear, uh, so I can repeat if necessary. Uh, so my, but my question to you is, have you had any contact or were you contacted by uh, other types of organizations? I'm thinking about uh, civil servant uh, unions, for example, because they, they should be worried about all this discourse on uh, using algorithms uh, in, in civil, you know, in, in, in the public sector. Uh, and so I don't hear anything from them, because they, 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 they could be allies in some way. Uh, on, on this, or, or other organizations that are that are uh, doing advocacy uh, related to this question of budget cuts and so on. So I think there is link. Yeah. So before you respond, uh, any does anybody have any questions besides Javier? Because we have just ten minutes. So um, no? okay, Javier. Well, I spent uh, two years uh, working with. Uh, I spent two years working with uh, <coughs> from the Open Rights Group in the UK. I spent two years working in the cabinet office in the UK on their data sharing program and the use of data. I mean, more than AI, this is about data sharing. 
most of the application of data science to the government. And we spent ages trying to figure out like a fair way of doing it that excludes everyone to kick out everything to do with police, you know, but about creating a, a fair framework. And my conclusion at the end, you know, since you said, you know, is that as long as you're dealing with the politics of austerity and a constant relationship between citizenships and the government, you know, you cannot have a fair system. Because you are already administering mystery, you know, so whatever you call it, you know, it's like it's just not going to work. We need to change the name. And in terms of uh, the relation with the unions, uh, not in this context, but with the open data process, which is the previous big bus thing, there was a big discussion of you know, the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands, the they shut down the whole sector and then they re-employ the same team and as a private sector contractor. And the thing is happening. And by an experience, actually, the people running the IT from the departments were the first ones that were really critical to the whole data bus and the media that technology and who they said with problems of having training, capacity building, uh, the, the quality of the regional data. So you know, we don't need like, new big data sharing, you know, we need this like good regional data. So I think I mean, there are lots and lots of problems before you get to the big AI you know, and factories. So, and in the government, the UK you know, is definitely on a big drive, you know, to use data and AI or whatever, but it might just be one of the so, so in, yeah, just so I want to repeat for the recording. So in the two last interventions, there was uh, the new aspect being brought to in relation uh, the relation between budget cuts and AI, and whether uh, you guys have been contacted by any uh, organization like civil servant unions, um, and maybe to actually have more allies. So we work with NGOs working on the left. Mm -hmm. There's a big part of the of fraud and debt is one of the number one. that has been going on. For years, they've been sharing data with Experian and things like that. And then some debt and euros are starting to get involved. So that it would be interesting to try to get more groups, disability groups, and other things that are affected by the cuts. We did quite a lot of that, and it's quite hard to get them. They see all this as technology, remote. And yeah. Okay, and in addition, what are your other allies that um, you Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, we're working a lot with civil rights groups um, uh, on, you know, um, AI and, and automated decision making. They obviously have a huge interest because they tend to um, be the most affected by bias, by uh, bias in existing data sets like criminal justice data sets, et cetera. Uh, I think the point about civil servants is a really interesting one. To, I mean, to me, as I already said, I, you know, I always think of bureaucracies as like, oh, they're, they're, they're like computers of a type. and. You know, I think there's a lot of potential to try and replace bureaucrats with machine with with computers, and also computers can be can be uh, computer programs and intelligence can be um, sent outwards into the tentacles of society, can be embedded within things. So it's almost as if you get bureaucratic rule sets that that, you, that, that exist in a big building, and now you can put it out into the world, and, to, and it can the rule sets can inherit in the Internet of Things and so forth, and um, and. Uh, shoot, what was this? my second point? I've lost it. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I'll have to come back to it. Yes. I think it's not a, what's interesting, this is not a classic digital rights issue. So a lot of, if you work on anything that has to do with discrimination, can be LGBT rights, can be disability rights, uh, welfare, welfare or, or represent people who are uh, receiving welfare, you are suddenly faced with a new way of discrimination that requires the technical expertise you don't necessarily have. So I think it is interesting. We try in our the strategy of our program, we try to incorporate this and make one of our goals um, for the next year to help others understand these issues better. Better and the only domain in which we're doing this now is policing, where we explain new policing technologies to defense lawyers, especially in, in the UK and in other European countries as well. But I think there's a massive need uh, to explain, like, what, how do I detect discrimination uh, when a machine learning system has been used in hiring? So to conclude, so there's, like, if there can be any conclusion, if uh, a government authority tells you um, that you could, uh, Jay, Stell, you know, I heard about this cyber magic, I am interested because I have a budget problems and I want to solve all the problems of the world, which one recommendation would you give uh, to this person? Uh, I'll start in the first order, so I start with you, Federica. One recommendation. Don't use proprietary software that you absolutely, <coughs> that neither you nor external auditors cannot investigate. Still? Uh, put this money into protecting human rights. <laughs> Sorry, that was not. Sorry, put this money in protecting human rights and privacy first. Um, 
proceed very, very carefully and cautiously and slowly with the attempting to use AI in decision making and be transparent and be transparent and be transparent as you can. Um, I probably ask the person, what does he not know about this system? All right, well, thank you so much uh, all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the discussions as much as I did and the panelists, I hope. Uh, so please join me in giving a round of applause.